Thanks, Margaret. <laughs> Um, no, it, it is a fact, though. You know, I, I first uh, interviewed Lonnie uh, uh, 20 years ago uh, when, as she said, I was a kid reporter just getting started in journalism, uh, writing about the effort to put a, um, a national African-American museum on the mall. And, and Lonnie, if you could just help me out here, how far back does this effort go? Well, the effort goes back to 1916. Right. And that really it picked up strongly in the 80s. And there were attempts to get the legislation through. And for a while, it was killed, oh, by people who didn't want this museum to exist at all. Mm -hmm. And then ultimately, it became a bipartisan effort that mm -hmm. got signed in 2003. Yeah, and so when I, when I was writing about it in the 90s, it was at least what it felt like. It was one of the low points. You know, it had gotten really, really close. There had been all this sort of internal, what I would call internal dissension, you know, among folks who, you know, I guess debates around how African American history should be represented, where it should be represented, and then you know we got really close, and then it got killed in Congress. Um, how did we get from that point where I think a lot of people had just thrown up their hands, and maybe I have that wrong, to this point where you actually have a museum on the mall 20 years later? I think part of it was that Jesse Helms is no longer with us. Right. I mean, Jesse uh, Helms. I'm just real thank real you for being honest okay. about that. Thank you. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but I also think that there was great division within the African-American community. Mm -hmm. Should there be a national museum? People felt they couldn't trust the Smithsonian. It was federal government. Right. Other small museums thought, but if you build this museum, then all of us are going to suffer in Chicago, Detroit. And so part of what brought it together was, for the first time, there was a bipartisan effort. Normally, in the early days, it would have been a Republican effort, then it was a Democratic effort. But because of John Lewis and his stature, he was able to bring conservative Republicans like Sam Brown back together and get the legislation through. Why? Wow. I mean, was it literally just Jesse Helms? I, I think of like people as representing interests, right? I mean, I, I know Jesse Helms is singular in terms of our history, but I think of him as representing something broader. Was it really just him? Well, Jesse Helms killed it every year. Right. But I think he, he represented a whole array of people who felt that um, African-American culture shouldn't be on the mall. Mm -hmm. Others who felt that, well, why isn't it completely integrated within the Museum of American History? Mm -hmm. Others who felt that if you open that door, here come the Irish, the Latinos, right. the Asian. So there were all those issues that got in the way of making this work. That, that actually leads to an interesting question for me, because I, I've, I've actually, you know, I was down, I was taking my little um, run on Sunday down the most after, you know, uh, the ceremony on Saturday, and I was looking at, you know, folks lining up to get in, and I, it occurred to me that there is a National African American Museum, there is a Native American Museum. Why doesn't, as you know, Jesse Helms said back then, why isn't it if we give them one, they'll all want one? Why not give them all one? How do you draw the line for which ethnic group, which culture is most, most salient uh, in American history, and who deserves a place on, on the mall and who does not? Well, the good news is I don't have to make that decision, but the reality <laughs> is that, um, candidly, what we have to do as historians is really say that all cultures are equally valid, but I'm not convinced their impact is equal. Mm -hmm. So the story of the African American is so central to America's def definition of itself, its notions of freedom and citizenship. So I would never say this is more important than another story, but I would say if you really want to understand America, this is the lens through which to look at. Right, right, right. Were you surprised that it became a bipartisan effort? Of course. Um, but I think that what I found fascinating, what I learned, was there were people like Sam Brownback, who I didn't think I had much in common with, right. who suddenly said he grew up on land that was once owned by John Brown. And uh -huh. he understood that the fight for freedom was an important part of America. Uh -huh. um, and so now many people may have gotten excited because they thought, well, if we build this museum, it says the fight for freedom's over. Right. Um, but for us, it was really an opportunity to say, this museum is much about today and tomorrow as it is about yesterday. And I'm just going to be honest. When you hear, those, were you surprised to hear those words coming from Sam Brown back, whose politics you may not necessarily agree with? And I'm, you know, I'm not, you know, being derisive towards Sam Brown, but it's a fact that, you know, there was some level of div division in terms of who supported the museum and who who did not. Well, I thought that uh, yes, I was surprised, but I was really pleased because, in some ways, what the museum has been able to do is really been able to bring people together and mm -hmm. straddle some of those lines. Mm -hmm. I mean, in some ways, it has been almost the only bipartisan effort in Washington over the last decade. Mm -hmm. um, it's brought together an array of people, and when I look at who funded the museum, it really speaks volumes of America. There are small people, you know, who give twenty-five dollars. African Americans large corporations. So for me, this is an opportunity to sort of 
look at America at its best. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And George W. Bush was who signed uh, the legislation in, into being. This is not, I know when I was reported on in 1996, this is not how we thought it would go. No, no. You know, I think, you know, much of the feeling was unless Democrats control the Senate, the House, and the President, exactly. that's the only way you're going get, exactly. get, to get a museum, you know. Uh, how did it feel to be there and, and to see President Bush, Bush giving, giving that speech, which I, you know, people I was, have raved about? I was impressed. I was so impressed. Mm -hmm. um, I was so pleased that he talked about a, a great nation facing its past. Mm -hmm. um, I was very pleased that he talked about slavery as the original sin. In many ways, it was really the speech that sort of set the tone for the rest of the day. Mm -hmm. How do you, you know, you, you, I, I know you, you, know, you, you had your post at, at the National um, Museum of American History before you did this. How did you reconcile the notion that African-American history in and of itself deserves its own specific place, as opposed to being integrated into the broader, you know, uh, history of, of, of America? This mirrors a larger debate that we have, you know, on our college campuses about how to talk about, you know, black studies departments, women's studies departments, for that matter, ac across the board. Um, one school of thought saying it would be better to integrate all of this into American history and make sure people are represented, and the other school of thought saying, listen, we need separate you know, things to make sure folks are represented. In some ways, I tried to straddle both worlds. Being at the Museum of American History, I realized that one building couldn't tell the story. Mm -hmm. um, that even if we integrated pieces in, which is really important for us to do, there was so much of the context that would be left out. But I also worried about creating a separate museum for black people by black people. And so what we did is we realized that this museum was not a museum simply of African-American culture. Mm -hmm. It was a museum that used a particular culture as a lens to better understand what it meant to be an American. Mm -hmm. To suggest that in some ways what this museum is is a complement to other Smithsonian museums, which give you different portals into what it means to be an American, whether it's through the technology of air and space mm -hmm. or the creativity of American art. We felt this was part of that endeavor, so for us, I really see this as a two-sided coin. Mm -hmm. One side is this deeply rich look at African-American culture and history, really looking at it and allowing America to confront its tortured racial past. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, it really is the saying, this is the story of us all. This is a story that profoundly shaped our notions mm -hmm. of freedom and citizenship. So in essence, what this museum did candidly was claim it's American. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And how did you think about it thematically? Like, it's one thing to say, okay, you know, we're going to have, you know, the museum gets approved. What does that look like, right? Like, you can't just do a, a straight timeline. Black people got here 16, 19, then right. this happened, then this happened. I mean, you have to have some sort of overarching, you know, theory, be it narrative or, or whatever. How did you come to that, and what is the theory behind yeah. it? I, I think that what we did is we spent two years interviewing people around the world, you know, getting focus groups, getting a sense of what people knew. Um, and when you say knew. around the world, like where? Like, give us an oh, idea of how, well, we how went, far we went. We went to... Ghana, to, to Joburg in South Africa. We did all over. We did Detroit. We did sort of major conferences around the country. Um, we did focus groups right here in, on 7th and, and F. Mm -hmm. And so I thought it was important for us to get that data. Mm -hmm. Then we brought the best scholars globally together and said, okay, you're an expert on slavery. What should we talk about? Mm -hmm. You're an expert on literature. What should we be talking mm -hmm. about? And then we married that together. The challenge for us was, unlike any other national museum, not only did we not have a building, we didn't have staff, mm -hmm. we didn't have collections, mm -hmm. we didn't have any money. Mm -hmm. So in essence, for us, we had to almost do this as if we were going on a cruise at the same time we were building a ship. So there was a this lot of This is after double. the president signed This is after the president signed right. So what, was there money put forth at that point uh, or not? There was a little bit of money. The budget was like a million dollars, Okay. right? So I had to figure out with our staff, how do we get the budget so that you can hire staff right. and then begin to raise all the funding. Right. And, and you guys had to do all this traveling around the world at the same time you're trying yeah. to figure out how to get the money together. To yeah, we weren't bored. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so what, what we ultimately came up with was the notion that by talking to the scholars that we thought the museum was really about saying thematically we are looking at how this museum shaped America and how African Americans made a way out of no way. Mm -hmm. A kind of look at the kind of nimbleness and creativity. Mm -hmm. And those two themes tie the museum together. Mm -hmm. We also thought it was crucial that most people didn't understand the narrative. So we created an, an exhibit that basically took you from Africa before contact with Europe and Europe before contact with Africa into the 21st century. Because we thought this museum had to talk about today, not just yesterday. You know, one of the questions I, I often get as a writer is, okay, yeah, we really like your work, but how, how are you going to get, you know, white people who don't necessarily agree or see this to see it? And, you know, 
because I'm a writer, I always get to opt out of that and say, that's not my job, you know? <laughs> that's not true of you. You know, when you're building a, a, a museum on the mall, you know, necessarily, you know, funded by the government, you necessarily are a part of the broader American narrative, and you do have, you know, some level of um, ambassadorship almost, you know, that, that, that you have to perform. Did you guys think about, like, for folks who don't know the story, who aren't, you know, really steeped in it, I guess white and black, how much thought went in the, you know, how do we, to be frank about it, how do we get white people to come to this sure. museum? I mean, we spent a lot of time talking about that. Right. I mean, I think that the reality is, though, that we had a benefit that you don't have if you were an African-American museum in Chicago, or right. Los Angeles, New York, and that is you're the Smithsonian. Because people come to the Smithsonian, regardless of race, to do the Smithsonian. So when I was a kid, I would come, my father would make me do natural history. I hated right. natural history. Right. But you're at the Smithsonian, you got to do right. it, right? So we recognize, <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. Um, we recognize that therefore, 70% of all the visitors, regardless of race, have said to us, we want to be in this museum. Now, there's a 30% I'd like to capture, but if I can get 70% of all Americans to grapple with this, I think we've done it. Did you job. literally take surveys? Absolutely. So you Figure take surveys, numbers. you say, who would you come to this museum? Absolutely. And 70% of the people, regardless of race, said, yeah, yeah. I, I, I would right. come see that. Be mainly because it was tied to the Smithsonian. Some were, you know, I've re rethought about African Americans I knew in the military or my new neighbors, but a lot of it was tied to that you're going to trust the Smithsonian. That is a very, very interesting. You know, one of the things I often say about being at the Atlantic is that I get to say things and people pay attention because it's the Atlantic. It's the imprimatur of an institution that allows you to, you know, say X, Y, and Z. Um, that leads to something else, though. There was always, you know, sort of this, as you, you know, alluded to earlier, this old sort of attention between folks who had independently been doing African-American museums all around the country. You know, in Baltimore, where I was, there was the Blacks and Whites Museum. DuSable in, in Chicago, there was an effort to build, I think, by uh, Governor Wilder, a uh, uh, slavery museum in Richmond, all sorts of, you know, local museums. I recall that being a, a huge, huge tension, because the feeling is that if there's a national museum, this will necessarily take away from our audience. This, you know, might even take away from our ability to, you know, have certain, you know, artifacts or, or, or whatever. Mm -hmm. How did you ultimately resolve that? Well, we realized that was job one. So part of what we did was realize that the deputy director, Kinshasa Oman Conwill, had run, run the Studio Museum in Harlem. I had create, helped create the California African American Museum. So we had some credentials mm -hmm. in that community. Mm -hmm. And then what we realized is, okay, how do we make that community feel better? Mm -hmm. Well, the first thing I did when I took this job was give the major opening address at their conference, said, you're the people that shaped who I am. And then we began to- How'd they, how they receive you? Perfectly, okay. wonderfully. Okay. Um, was that old tension in the air? Was of course there? it was. Yeah. There was this real sense of, you know, here he comes, he's now, you know, at the Smithsonian, he's gonna take all of our stuff. And you represent the man. I mean, that's, that's you come in, you're representing the okay, man. Okay, now wait, let's not go crazy <laughs> here, okay? All right, you know, you know I'm, in this, I'm on the same farm with the man, but let's not, you know. But I mean, uh, in the sense that, like, they represent independent, like, right. at least they see themselves as right. independent institutions. Right. Let's say, let's not say the man. Okay. But you're coming in as, as part of the government, right? right. I mean, that, that, that right. really is who right. you're back in. And necessity. I think that was part of the fear. The fear right. was, could you tell the truth and be part of the federal government? Right. And part of the notion was, <laughs> you know, um, we were lucky. We worked with John Hope Franklin, the great historian, always said, mm -hmm. your job is to tell the unvarnished truth. Right. And so basically, we actually created a unit in the museum whose job it is just to collaborate with African American museums. Mm -hmm. So therefore, I wanted to make sure that everything we did didn't just benefit us. Mm -hmm. So when we went around the country to find artifacts, we brought local museums into that discussion, and when we found things, we told people, give it to the local museum first. Mm -hmm. Now, it was really cool, we came back mm -hmm. to D.C., mm -hmm. but on the whole, it was really saying, we're part of this, so everybody benefits by our presence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so is the feeling now one of support? Are people? I would say um, the feeling is more than supportive. There's a sense of people realizing that the visibility, the attention that this gets has a ripple effect in your local community. And so by the kind of work we do, it suddenly gives a kind of imprimatur to a museum in Dallas or a museum in Los Angeles. And we've been very clear that our ability to do this museum is only because all the work that's been done in these local museums. We constantly make sure people know mm -hmm. how important they are. You know, one of the things, um, I was doing some reporting some years ago on actually, you know, the, the national parks, because one of the more disenchanting things is that black people do not go to the Civil War. But even though this, this is very, very central to African-American history, black folks don't go to Gettysburg, they don't, you know, go down to Petersburg or, you know, wherever. Um, 
And they actually had numbers on this. Do you take numbers of, will you take numbers on the number of white visitors you actually have um, to the National African American Museum? I don't think I'm gonna count white folks versus black folks, but mm -hmm. I think what we do is we always gauge how diverse our audience is. Mm -hmm. um, because in some ways, we really wanna make sure that we are serving a community, but we define that community much broader than simply the African American community. How supportive was the, um, the Smithsonian, your sister museums? How would you describe that relationship? Okay. Um, <laughs> the reality is that because this is my third Smithsonian Museum, it was easier than, mm -hmm. than one might have anticipated. Mm -hmm. When I came back, because we had such a small staff, I had to reach out to... What was the one besides the American? It's American, African, well, American. Well, I was at the Air and Space Museum. Ah, okay. Um, okay. Yeah, I was a kid at 25 who knew nothing about airplanes but needed a job, so I said, I'll, be air, I'll become an airplane expert. Right, right. Um, and so I think that for us, by able, being able to reach out, there was great support. Mm -hmm. But I think that, candidly, the Smithsonian moved because the public got excited, because we were able to raise the money, because we were able to find the collection, because we were able to bring the scholars. I think then the Smithsonian got excited, and, candidly, every Smithsonian leader was very supportive. But I think that it was really based on our ability to be successful. We felt we couldn't afford to make big mistakes. I, w I want just, and you can correct me if I'm wrong here, but my recollection over the, the um, effort to get a Native American museum on the mall was not as contentious. Is that correct? I think that it definitely wasn't as contentious. I think there was part of a notion that a lot of what was driving the Native American Museum was both a respect for Native people that were still existent, also there were large numbers, like thousands of Americans that were collectors of Native American material. So I think that the notion of creating the museum was so supported. What it turned out to be might have been a little different than some of the supporters may have wanted it to right, be. Right, right, right. How so? Well, I mean, I think that in some ways this wasn't a museum of cowboys and Indians. It was a museum that really um, referred to the native community and really right. made sure that the most important thing you knew is that native people were still existing. Right, right, right. Is there some tension to being, you know, this goes back to, you know, what we were talking about earlier to some extent, but is there some tension to telling the African American story through the Smithsonian? through, you know, the, you know, the, uh, the auspices of, of, of the federal government, you know, given what the federal government's relationship sure. often has been sure. to African-American people, there's some tension in that. Absolutely. We have said to everybody that works with us, the key to surviving in this museum is tension, mm -hmm. is to understand you're going to play out that tension. So part of what we really had to do was realize being right, being smart wasn't enough. Right. We had to be political. So we had to build alliances. When I first came back, the first thing I did was get 30 angels in Congress so on both sides of the aisle. So when somebody criticized us, I could get somebody to say, well, wait a minute, that's okay, because in Congress, I don't need to win. I just need a tie. Right. I, you know, and so <laughs> that's really what we tried to do. And the same thing, candidly, with the media. Right. We spent a lot of time making ourselves visible, showing that we existed, showing that we were important so that we had that kind of support. So you can't be a director like me without being political in this town. Did you change any minds in Congress? Like, did you go into meetings and after people met you and talked to you, you know, they said, Absolutely. Okay. Uh -huh. I, I, you know, I can remember several meetings where people have said to me, look, we like you, but you shouldn't build this museum. Right. Um, and by the end of the meeting, we were able to convince people to at least not oppose us. So are you optimistic about humanity now? Oh, I won't. <laughs> <this thing? laughs> I mean, I gotta tell you, listen, maybe I was a kid or maybe it's just my personality, but you know, in 96, I was like, oh my God, this is the absolute worst. We have to convince these people about the centrality of African-American history and one guy is gonna scuttle all this work that's been going on right. since 19. I mean, it was deeply depressing to be, to be frank with you. It was depressing to me. I think right. the reality is though, that we realized how central African-American history is, partly because of all the great scholarship, mm -hmm. right? So we had that going for us. I am unbelievably optimistic coming out of a community that believed when it shouldn't have believed. Mm -hmm. A community that should have been destroyed mm -hmm. um, and found ways to survive. Mm -hmm. So optimistic, at least hopeful. Right. And also I think that what allowed us to do this, no matter how difficult it was, was that we knew we came from people whose backs were bent, but whose spirits weren't broken. Right. And that allowed us to keep moving forward. How joyful were you on Saturday? Oh boy, I'm telling you, I was about as happy as could be. <laughs> Although I was too tired to be happy. <laughs> uh. 
Well, Alain, I, I, just, I want to thank you so much for this, you know, it's a reunion for me, and thank you so much for sharing, you know, your, your vision of the museum, and it's been a long time coming, so it's a beautiful thing to see. Thank you, guys. Thank, thank you so you. much. Thank you.